Hi, it's John Reed. I'm live at Controlling 2019, a show for hardcore SAP controllers and SAP finance enthusiasts. And I've got my keynoter with me, Barbara Haas. How's it going? Great. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, and you gave an awesome keynote on what you're working on over the Discovery Channel. I'm a huge shark fan, so you had me from the get-go. What kinds of things are you guys learning over at Discovery Channel about SAP and how your business is changing and how SAP can kind of support that? Well, certainly one of the things the Discovery Channel cable TV is changing drastically over the years. We're trying yeah. not to become the Kodak story. So with the invention of Netflix and all the other streaming products, Discovery Channel is working really hard to contain and maintain its audience figure. So as the business changes, moving to more digital, subscriber-based, et cetera, we're trying to keep pace. And yet you're heavily invested in SAP, which is not always known as the most nimble system. True. And and what is your role in all of that? Like, how do you align SAP with what you're trying to do and everything? Is that where you stand in all this? Yeah. So um, I work between finance and IT, ensuring effective mm. and efficient delivery of any SAP projects, heavily in merger and acquisitions, and also any of the business changes as we're looking into new and different invoicing systems, et cetera, and bringing together all of the information to form a uh, stable financial reporting landscape. Between finance and IT, that sounds like a pretty scary place. How do you bridge that gap? I guess that's really what you talked about attendees with today. It can be a very dark place or it can be a very <laughs> sunny place, I guess, yeah. depending upon what you make of it. I've certainly you know, been straddling the two worlds for the 15 years or so that I've been at Discovery. It's been challenging, but certainly very, very rewarding. Probably one of the most re rewarding professional relationships um, I've had over the years has been with the, um, our internal SAP team and the business and helping each one of them be even more effective than they can be at their existing roles. Yeah, one of the themes I really enjoyed in your keynote is you're saying, you know, okay, we're checking along, and then along comes the cloud. Why, why was the cloud kind of disruptive to everything for you? So, uh, you know, our first instance with a cloud product was probably about eight years or so. It was with our treasury group. We had been using an SAP tool, and it wasn't doing exactly what we needed at that point in time. The user group went out and acquired their own um, cloud solution. And we learned along the way some of the hardships of why they made the decision they did. Did they make the right decision? Did we provide them the right kind of support that they needed? We sort of let them go too fast, too early, too soon. And they got into quite a lot of trouble with their platform and their vendor and other areas. Um, and we vowed to not make those mistakes again. Yeah, you talked about kind of the new silo, right, that that you want to empower business users, but they could end up creating new silos, which creates all kinds of problems, right? Exactly. And that's why one of the things we're trying to find the balance between letting them go and keeping them a bit grounded. And that's mm -hmm. why we try and partner with them from the beginning while they're choosing software, making sure that they're using the right selection criteria and that they're weighting those appropriately, not picking tools with pretty dashboards, but also tools that fit well into the landscape and data and platform support and ensuring that after they purchase it, as they continue throughout their life cycle, that they're making the right changes and updates, et cetera. We're all in the same financial solutions landscape. They just can't simply end up, uh, operate independently in a silo. They have to operate and play with the rest of the group. One of the things that really surprised me in your keynote was you talked about governance being kind of a core thing that you had to look after with the, with the cloud solutions. And yet you had testimonials from both IT and finance users who were really happy with the work. So you imposed a bunch of rules on people, but they were still happy. So how did you do that? Well, I think they've seen the areas where they scaled. Certainly, whatever work stream we're talking about that's looking to acquire a cloud solution, they're certainly more skilled over myself or anybody in my team in that area. Yet in these areas of governance or working with third parties or working with software development lifecycle, um, we're certainly more skilled than they are. So I think they've come to learn that that balance is important in the successful project for the scalability and long-term um, longevity of it. And what, what did you hope, like, after delivering your keynote, what were you kind of hoping that attendees would take away? These are uh, SAP finance people. Some of them are lead roles going back to their projects. Uh, what did you want them to learn? 
One of the things that certainly always surprises me is this isn't the job that I stepped into when I came to Discovery. It sort of evolved over time with the changing needs and how the company has grown. Um, and we put it to paper. One of the things that I love about presenting this keynote is when people come up to me afterwards and say, wow, I feel like that's me. I didn't know that. I could portray that into something larger or how effective and efficient I could be, but I love that it resounds with people and they come to me to off afterwards to talk about um, their opportunities and the areas that they can grow in. To me, that's um, very rewarding to hear that afterwards. Yeah, and the one thing is that that IT business gap like has to be forged, has to be dealt with. Like, I don't care whether you're dealing with classic SAP ERP or newfangled cloud or robotics, which I want to ask you about in a minute, you still have this issue. If, if that's not solved, then none of the new tech is going to do anything for you. That's right. They're all, we're all in the same landscape, even if they think they're a work stream and they're off in the corner. You know, SAP is the company's ERP and everything has to end up in the, in the landscape with harmonized data and working together in the end. And sort of our work streams have learned over time, it's better if we work on that collaboration from the beginning versus forcing it towards the end. Right. You know, you and I were just in a session on the SAP Analytics Cloud and uh, what the True Call was putting on, and they, they he asked the audience, Scott asked the audience, about what's the key to financial planning and analytics success, and you, you set first out collaboration. That's right. Which is really interesting because cl classic tools, and I don't want to just pick on SAP here, but classic tools in this area weren't very collaborative. So what, what's emerging here? What we're seeing and some of the competitors, et cetera, is the ability to set up, whether that be calendars or notifications or, hey, look what I just built, et cetera. And I think that's becoming more and more uh, important in the daily world, you know, for um, people that are using on their mobile phones and apps all weekend and features and websites, usability to come into work on Monday morning and have to go back into, you know, the dark ages, et cetera, and not be able to communicate that way at work while they're doing that in their social and personal lives is, is very mm -hmm. important. Um, and I think that's a space that, um, you know, certainly SAP has worked in with Analytics Cloud and putting that wrap around BPC that didn't exist before. So do you think you made progress in this area of collaboration at work? I know it's a tough one. Um, you know, we've had some other focuses. It, it comes mm -hmm. up every, you know, two years or so. We've had some yeah. other focuses in the last two years at Discovery with some merger and acquisition work, et cetera. Yeah, you had but a big it's something, one, huh? yep. But it's something that comes around when the company quiets back down and we get back to core business and improvements. It's one of the mm -hmm. first things that continually comes up. So we'll be like taking another look at Analytics Cloud sometime soon. One of the topics we didn't get into today, but that you got into in a webinar you did with us is is your forays into robotics. What are you learning there? That's right. Well, that certainly has been, you know, I think I said it this morning, which is we always make mistakes. Every company makes mistakes. We're definitely not perfect. But one of my mantras is never make the same mistake twice. Yeah. So certainly with that, with robotics, we've learned that that needs to be, again, it is part of the landscape. And that is not something that can be sta stood up alone, separate. It needs the exact same of kind of governance that any ERP implementation would need, that exact same partnership with IT. And I watched, you know, some rounds of robotics fail at Discovery because, again, that was one of our learning experiences. Originally, we left them alone and realized that that instance has to be kept as close to the best as any other cloud product or mm -hmm. any other provider that we're bringing into the solutions landscape. When we come up with a business process or a business problem, it's up to those governance teams to sit together and figure out which is the best place. Is it some process improvement? Is it light mm -hmm. automation using Excel? Is it deep automation using ERP? Or is it something swivel chair best suited for robotics? Again, it requires that full governance team and both finance and IT partnering to ensure what is the right process and where it should be put. Yeah, and you actually shared a, a governance framework with everyone here that kind of, I won't go through all of it, but you have these stages of identify and initiate and RFP and select. So you managed to really do define a method that I guess you can apply to all of these. Exactly, things. and that's what I'm saying. It's, it's rather textbook governance. All that mm. we're doing is enforcing it consistently across finance. And when I look at some of the other groups that don't have that sort of voice coming from within, whether it be HR and their tool sets or marketing or creative, 
any of those groups. This is one of the powerhouses of finances that we do have this governance that we insist is applied across any of the tools that make it into our solutions landscape. So when you talk about robotics, are there interesting use cases that are that are coming up that you're saying, how oh, here here's actually a role where we can use use an automation service here or something? Are you starting to figure that out? Or? Yeah, we've got a couple of um, powerful um, uh, processes in production on master data, mm-hmm. also interfacing with banks. And again, I had mentioned that as a median industry, we have a lot of third-party business systems, which unless mm-hmm. we have some deep technical interfaces to SAP, which we do, enable a lot of, there's a lot of swivel chair data entering between uh, between systems, keying and left, keying and right. And that's where we're using our robotics instance to really help in repetitive data entry, um, role-based repetitive data entry between our third-party systems and SAP. Mm. The other thing I liked in your keynote today is you talked a little bit about, you were kind of upfront about different personalities. You mentioned someone on your team is pretty different than you and, you know, battles that you guys have kind of had, but then kind of working through it. And to me, that's all part of you're doing a session here on change management. And I liked how you were honest about the fact that it's not always perfect, right? You have to figure out how to make these relationships work. Definitely. And what I've learned over time is not only is it different um, relationship to relationship, work stream to work stream, but throughout an entire project life cycle, the needs are just different mm-hmm. at each phase gate. What a user needs and requirements is very different than in a blueprint phase or in delivery, testing, post, go live. And it's important that the change management structure adapt itself to each one of those phase gates um, for what's needed not only by user but by phase. Tell me about Tier 2. That's something you covered a bit in the webinar you did with us. What are you doing there? So Discovery had, again, as I mentioned this morning, Discovery is growing absolute hand over fist. And we had um, opening in so many countries, left, right, and center. Um, We had a need for SAP all over the globe, and we couldn't get to every single country. Some of our smaller countries, we determined that just weren't, didn't have the footprint and weren't a full SAP implementation. That didn't mean they didn't have the right to a standardized coding block to, um, you know, harmonize functionality or consistency and control. And a lot of that functionality is being outsourced third-party accountants, third-party software. And so we went out and procured, I followed the governance model, by the way. Mm. We went out and procured nice. it. <laughs> I followed it's my own like, governance model. Sort of a phrase, I mean, it's a drink your own Kool-Aid kind of thing, but there should be a phrase for that where you put yourself through your own compliance. It's like self-compliance there or something. There you go, self-compliance. Yeah. We went yeah. through our own governance model and somebody else sat and, you know, made sure we were weighing our criteria appropriately, mm-hmm. not buying the first tool that had the dashboard on it. But what we set up was, you know, a, a very strict, again, tier one, tier two governance model about which, um, what kind of locations, whether it's growth trajectory or integrations or size, visibility, risk, control belong in our tier one system and what belongs in tier two. Mm. And actually, based upon my knowledge working with the SAP team and our global template that we had built in our tier one system, we built a small watered down version in tier two. Mm. In terms of governance, we sit together. It's that same committee, that same partnership with IT. And when we look at a new location, we look at it together, both teams together. We have a standard questionnaire. We take and take all of the information, and together as the governance team, we decide with our stakeholders which is a better fit, Tier 1 or Tier 2, under that same governance model. I think our listeners would find it interesting to know that, that you're not yet an S4 HANA uh, in, uh, operation, which is interesting just because you guys were so aggressively pursuing digital projects, and yet you're still ECC 6.0 at the core, uh, but you do have, you are running HANA, or That's you're right. on a journey That's there. Right. So, so how, how does this all work? Uh, are, you, are you eventually going to be looking at S4, or does ECC do what you need it to do, or how does that work? Well, it certainly does where we need it to today, and one of the classic problems of discovery that has always been, especially over the last seven years with the trajectory we spoke, is that uh, discovery has been so seriously in the M&A market, it's mm. hard for us to find a space. Um, to look right. at it. The other thing is once we find a space, we usually have a backlog of projects from the two years we've just spent doing an M&A activity. So we've had um, three hard looks now at S4 HANA for each one has been sort of a different business driver. One of the, the second time we looked, it was quite interesting because both Discovery and Scripps had been on their own independent journey to, towards S4 and we brought our heads together, looked at it, 
to see if that was the driver for our business problem at that point in time. And we decided with some other business factors that were happening, it was more important to harmonize the two companies for immediate mm. cost savings than moving to us for. Right. Most recently, we've been looking at again to solve two different business problems at the company. The first one being content return on investment on our shows. Um, and how we get real visibility into that content programming pipeline. Mm. And the second business problem that we're trying to solve is bringing together financial and non-financial together in a Harmony's data way. As I mentioned, we have a large amount of third-party um, mm. software and having that data in different data lakes, et cetera, than SAP causes us enormous amounts of reporting problems. So those are the two business challenges that we're currently looking to solve, potentially with S4. Yeah, and that was a question I had asked you at the keynote this morning because with all the talk you gave, I was thinking, what is the role of data and analytics and all this? And, it, and you kind of said, well, we're still figuring some of that out. Constantly evolving. Yeah. It's one of those yeah. areas I can't say we, we have not yet solved it. It's certainly our challenge. Yeah. And um, as discovery morphs into different and new businesses, mm -hmm. we're challenged, you know, trying to keep up with that subscriber information and customer information, et cetera. Therefore, that's why you were in the SAP Analytics Cloud session that I was in to kind of kick tires and figure out. And, you know, I think what's interesting about this, too, is, like you said, like so many of these decisions now, like programming decisions, for example, like, Time is of the essence, right? Like you want to be able to get good, trusted data on that quickly and be able to make so-called agile decisions, which is so different than how things used to work, right? That's Where right. you would let let things play out over a long period of time, and then you would gather up the reports and try to make sense of what was working, you know? That's exactly right. And in the content life cycle at Discovery, you know, we don't have that 18-month lead yeah. time anymore. The business, you know, the, the consumer market has changed so drastically that lead time has to be shorter. Absolutely. I mean, we know that people love to watch sharks, but you need more data than just that. So. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to get you to your next session, but I do want to give you a chance to kind of um, plug um, Discovery because I really, really love your work there. Um, what what motivates you? Why are you inspired by being there? Discovery, that's a great question. Discovery is... A very creative company. It, um, you know, it's a relatively newer company. It's not a hundred year old manufacturing environment and it really supports creativity. I started at the company in a, you know, a project based role and it has literally allowed me to reach my hand on topics and projects outside of what was originally in my scope and that's fostered. And because it's a very creative company, it has you know, allowed, enabled, and supported this kind of group that mm -hmm. I sit in the middle of, which is, you know, if you're in a cost-cutting mode and you would, you know, certainly don't want to take out your finance people, you don't want to take mm -hmm. out your IT developers, but a group like this sitting in the middle could be low-hanging fruit. Right. But being a creative company that they are, they they value that uh, added um, enhancement to both of those teams mm -hmm. and not only enable it, but support it. I've gotten amazing executive support, both from the finance it's an IT organization over the years that um, I'm not sure could mm -hmm. be met anywhere else. And if I'm a listener, why should I watch Discovery if I haven't if I if I haven't seen it yet? What what should I why should I watch? For the love of factual entertainment and learn about your world. That's mm. what the Discovery Company was originally founded on by John Hendricks, mm. um, and that's what it's striving to to teach people about the world they live in. Well, one thing I did want to ask you as we wrap up here is it, it is Ada Lovelace Day. I was just checking the calendar to make sure it is today. Um, but um, this is sort of a celebrating achievements of, of women, particularly women in technology in our industry. Um, how, how would you sort of share your journey with, with, a, with younger women who are trying to achieve some of the things you've achieved? What, what would you say to them? I was just uh, speaking with a young young mother at the break. I was saying, um, you know, one of the things it takes, it takes very uh, effective juggling and management. One mm -hmm. of the things, you know, I do at the beginning of the year, take the entire school year and put it on my calendar and, you know, never miss a moment at school. I make time for all of those school events. I never mm -hmm. miss any of them. Um, and it's challenging to do in a, in a high-powered business environment like the one that mm -hmm. I work in. Um, but I would encourage everyone to continue to make time um, for their families and children. Don't ever miss those events. And um, I've been very empowered by a discovery to do that, too. Good advice for a lot of aspiring female professionals out there. So thank you for that. 
And I'll get you off to your session, but I appreciate your time today, and thanks for sharing on this mysterious topic of IT business alignment. Let's get it a little closer. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it.